watching everyone i'm daniel green and you're in my kitchen and we're talking about the cannabinoid cookbook which is our latest project i've written 12 books over my career and they've always been on healthy eating and i've designed menus for airlines and hotels but i love to make real simple easy food but we've come up with a great concept and we're going to talk all about it with dr joe furestein integrated health at columbia medical and also stanford he's going to tell you all about his credentials but there is a brilliant way that you can have food that helps you relax, it helps you de-stress, it helps you sleep. It's all to do with cannabinoids. And when we think of cannabinoids, um, there are plants that are rich in cannabinoids, which is marijuana. That's not this. There are certain foods that are rich in cannabinoids, and we've used, an, uh, used 11 of them in this cookbook to really focus on some of them and how you can get the benefits. So over to Dr. Joe. So welcome everybody. Thanks so much, Daniel. Uh, Daniel is my co-author uh, and chef extraordinaire. Um, and just very briefly about how we came up with this. My, my credentials are that um, I am an integrated medicine physician fellowship trained in integrated medicine. I've seen 45,000 patients in the last 15 years in integrated medicine. Um, and I'm a professor, an assistant professor at Columbia. So I teach fellows and residents and medical students. Uh, I've published about 30 papers on um, nutrition and integrated medicine. And uh, one of my uh, biggest uh, projects now is, is my second book. My first book was a diet book. This is actually more elegant. It's really to do with the concept of uh, cooking uh, and cannabinoids. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over a little bit so we understand what we're talking about. And then uh, Chef Daniel is going to take us to the kitchen and show us some of the recipes. And I'm going to highlight the star ingredients um, and why we would we want to be focusing, why would we want to put emphasis on these ingredients to do what's called cannabinoid rich cooking, because that's what we're trying to do here. So that obviously is the cookbook. It's an absolutely beautiful book. It's a, a lovely a coffee table book that's uh, beautiful pictures that we're both very, very proud of. And it really is energizing your endocannabinoid system with food and spices. And we're going to go over this a little bit. So just to always, whenever I give a lecture, I like to give people expectations of what's going to happen in the next uh, little bit. So we're going to start off with the basics. What is the endocannabinoid system and why that is important in our body? A little bit about the history because the history is quite fascinating. And then we're going to talk about one of the ingredients, black pepper, which will then, that's the star ingredient for Daniel Chef Daniel's first dish. Then we're going to uh, talk a little bit about holy basil, uh, omegas, we're going to talk about truffles and we're going to finish with dark chocolate um, and two recipes that he'll be cooking. Again, very interesting. Uh, Daniel has been on two series in the Food Network. He is an international celebrity chef and it's always fun watching him cook and listening to his very interesting commentary as he does so. So the endocannabinoid system. And yes, this does have something to do with cannabis. That's a plant we're all aware of. There is cannabis sativa, that's the main plant. There are different versions of it, different types of it. This is arguable, sativa, indica, and ruderalis, but some people consider them all to be just types of sativa. What is the endocannabinoid system? It is a complex signaling system in the body and is stimulated by two of the major cannabinoids, as we call them, that are found in cannabis sativa and that is thc tetrahydrocannabinol which is what makes us high and cbd which anybody who knows anything or has done anything any kind of interest in wellness is going to be aware of cbd so what does the endocannabinoid system do it is essentially it's incredibly important and when i was in medical school we'd never even heard of it and now we recognize this as an incredibly important system in the same way as the cardiovascular system or the respiratory system or the endocrine system are in the body there's literally a system of the body and its entire job is to get us back in balance there is a word for that homeostasis what gets you back to balance after something happens. What does that mean? The endocannabinoid system is in regulation of sleep, in stress, mood, metabolism, appetite, digestion, learning and memory, fertility, bone health, liver health, cardiovascular health. And obviously, because of its relationship to CBD that we all use in integrative medicine for pain, inflammation, also in pain and inflammation. So just to 
conceptualize this, whatever happens to your body, whenever you get any kind of trauma, whatever trauma it is, the body is trying to get back into balance. And I'm going to use that word again and again, because that's literally what this system is doing. How do we get back? How does the heart rate go back to normal? How does the blood pressure go back to normal? How do the blood vessels get back to their normal diameter? How does the respiratory uh, system, how does it start to calm down? How does our brain, chemicals in our brain, get back into balance? That, my friends, is entirely the endocannabinoid system, getting us back into our ideal operating function. And there is actually a clinical syndrome to this called CECD, clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, where this system doesn't work well, and it is postulated, it is thought that that might have an effect on chronic medical conditions like migraine, irritable bowel syndrome, or fibromyalgia. So this system is incredibly important, uh, perhaps underappreciated, and that is the reason why the book is there. Now, very briefly with the history, we have been using cannabis sativa since Egyptian times. The Ebers papyrus was all about using uh, cannabis for medicinal purposes. But really the godfather of the endocannabinoid system, bar none, no one would argue with this, is Professor Rafi Mahulam, Hebrew University in Israel, and he is essentially who came up with the following story. 1960s, he's a postdoc in Israel, and he is interested in cannabis sativa, cannabis, and he wants to know what is the active ingredient. We know what morphine does. We know that it works. We've been using morphine, the milk of the poppy, for thousands of years. We've been using cannabis for thousands of years. What does it actually do? So he started off by what is in cannabis that is the active ingredient. And he isolated in the 1960s tetrahydrocannabinol. 20 years later, research continues. And the obvious question is, we know cannabis contains THC. What is it doing on the body? And so in 1984, they isolated receptors in the brain, which actually are inhibitory in nature. They chill you out. They relax you. It's actually one of the most abundant receptors in the brain. And it modulates the effect of all the other chemicals in the brain that govern our mood and our cognition and our alertness, etc. And that was first isolated the CB1 receptors of the brain in 1984. In 1989, we then found that there were other receptors not in the brain, this time in the body. And they also worked on the endocannabinoid system. So the endocannabinoid system is receptors in the brain, CB1 and the body CB2. And all of those effects that I told you about are modulated by those. Now, the most cool part of this is the obvious question. If we have receptors in our brain and our body, CB1, CB2, they are naturally there, then there must be some natural cannabis-like compound that we make in our body, our own natural marijuana. And that is exactly what they found um, in the 1990s, in 1992, in fact, anandamide and 2-AG. And they are literally your body's own cannabis. Because the body had, before we ever were using cannabis, we were using, our body had its own endocannabinoid system. The most important, in, my, in our opinion, in terms of the book, was Dr. Professor Mahulam uh, in the late 1990s came up with a concept, and this is literally the scientific concept behind the book the entourage effect. And the idea was that there are 140 different cannabinoids found in cannabis. It's not just two, uh, THC and CBD. There are cannabis uh, cannabinoids and there are terpenes and all of these effects on the body. He postulated that the best way that cannabis works is working multiple different ways at the same time. So the point of the book is that we use lots of different foods that all work on the endocannabinoid system in different ways. And you want to have a cannabinoid rich diet. So you are stimulating this system to chill yourself out and get back into homeostasis, the best function you can be, multiple different ways at the same time. And that was literally the entourage effect. So to get to the first food, we have black pepper and now we're going to cook. Black pepper, very briefly, this is one of my faves. This is the king of spices. It's one of the most traded spices in the world. 
Uh, I think we've all seen the plant. It's a vine-like plant. The fruit of the pepper is the peppercorn. We cook it, we dry it, we grind it. And that, my friends, is black pepper. It's um, southern, southern India and Vietnam. It's been used for thousands of years. It has a essential oil and the essential oil is potently antimicrobial. So it has uh, effects on bacterial infections. And also black pepper happens to have uh, effects on gas and the gut. So it's an aid for digestion, which is no wonder that it's used so extensively in Asian cooking. Uh, there are some health benefits like vitamin K and manganese. Now, the most important part in, you know, in terms of black pepper is how it affects the endocannabinoid system. So black pepper has an oil. When you grind it, there's an oil coming out. The oil is the essential oil that's incredibly important in integrative medicine. The essential oil of black pepper contains a terpene compound called beta carophyllin. Beta carophyllin is also found in cannabis. Cannabis sativa contains beta carophyllin. In fact, cannabis sativa contains the oil of cannabis is between four and almost 40% beta carophyllin. So that's one of the main ingredients of cannabis essential oil. It's about 8% of the essential oil of black pepper, still an appreciable amount. Beta carophyllin stimulates the CB2 receptors of the body. And so by having a diet rich in black pepper, you are helping stimulate the CB2 receptors, which is going to have an effect on chilling you out, yes, but also, just like CBD, help reduce inflammation, pain, and, uh, um, and some uh, um, infl inflammatory conditions um, in the periphery of your body. So that was black pepper. And I think Chef Daniel is now going to cook a wonderful recipe. Go ahead, my friend. I'm um, about ready to cook some black pepper. Great. Right. Black pepper. Um, I've done a lot of Asian dishes as well. So uh, I'm very much used to using pepper shrimp. And that's going to be the one I'm doing now. I'm just going to adjust my camera because I think now we've lost Dr. Joe. I might be a little bit too much in the screenshot. But Andrew, if you could tell me if my screen is okay and uh, you can see me okay or if it's a little bit um needs to go back because i think we may have lost dr joe for a second I, I, I can hear you i just i think that i can't see you okay uh, well if that looks good to me daniel okay excellent so i'm going to show you the ingredients i've got some red onion and that's just been finely chopped i'm going to make this sauce before i cook the shrimp and i'm just going to put a little bit of oil in that pan and we're just going to cook over very quickly um those uh, red onions now i've got the wrong gas on here i should know it's my own kitchen so the ingredients are going to be beautiful shrimp the ingredients is going to be pepper of course lots of it and don't be shy when we put the ingredients in those easy recipes we use quite a lot of it then we've got a little bit of hoisin sauce make it nice and sticky and caramelized fish sauce that a lot of people don't love it's very prominent in thai food doesn't smell very good on its own but it adds a salty effect. So there's lots of different components. We do, we do um, like it in this, but it isn't necessary if you don't love it. Lemongrass, ginger, and garlic, and coconut milk. So we're gonna make the sauce, and while I make the sauce, I'm gonna fry over the shrimp. Now, normally my cooking's always very light. It's always very healthy. And actually, in today's world, this could be very paleo and keto-friendly, because we allow coconut milk. Um, I oil the food, rather than the pan that way you don't end up using a lot of oil to fry so it's a good way to do that when you're cooking i'm going to get those shrimp in the pan and they take seconds to cook don't ever overcook seafood you just want to cook it till it changes color that's in a non-stick pan and those shrimp will be cooking in a second as i turn them and then it's back to the sauce to those onions which are now just sweating and cooking well i'm going to give them about a minute i'm going to add a little bit of garlic i'm going to add a little bit of lemongrass and all my recipes are very easy i promise you um, i try and make them as easy as possible and ginger um, just because i want you to have ingredients that you've got in your pantry or you're used to buying and there's a lot of these recipes in that book um, a lot of the omega-3s we've done turmeric cloves um, lots of chicken dishes, lots of kind of basics, but just spiced up a little bit. And I think you'll find, you know, most of them very uh, 
friendly, that you haven't really got things that you can't make or wouldn't make. Um, there's a beautiful scallop in rosemary. I love that one. My goodness, as simple as could be. I do love seafood. I do love protein. We've got flax. We've got some nice brownies and cookies in here. And all these things are going to make you feel good. So as it's cooking along, I'm going to give that a little stir. And we make the sauce. And then I add some of this coconut milk. So a little bit of the cream on top. And then it should be the milk underneath. Because it does kind of get a little bit lumpy before you blend it. Shrimp are almost cooked. I'm going to break down this sauce a little bit. And that coconut cream. Now you can buy the half fat. That's pretty good too. You can always adjust the recipe to that one. I might end up using a whisk here. I'm just going to turn these shrimps. The shrimp are just about cooked, to be honest. On a nice high heat, going to turn a couple of those over. And then we're going to start to add the black pepper, which, of course, is the star of this dish. So the shrimp are almost there. Turn one more of them. Let's get a lot of black pepper on those shrimp. Let's get a lot of black pepper in that sauce. A lot. But obviously all the ingredients are in the book, so you can make sure you find those. And to that, I'm going to add a dash of fish sauce, just a dash. You really want to use a quarter of a teaspoon. And I'm going to take some hoisin sauce, which I love. It's got a lot of sticky, wonderful flavor in that. I'm probably making enough for two people, but the recipes all are for four people. And then that sauce is almost done. And it's just going to come to the boil. We don't want to overboil when we're using coconut milk. Um, we don't want it to kind of split. And it's now a kind of sticky, dark color. And it is absolutely getting nice and thick and beautiful. Um, you can keep it paleo. I've got some rice. You can serve it with cauliflower rice, which is lovely. And then I'm going to swap over this pan. And I'm going to pour some of that sticky sauce on here. And then it kind of caramelizes a little bit more. Turn that heat up. You can add some chopped chives or scallions. It's bubbling away beautifully. And I'm ready to serve it up. Pepper shrimp. There it is. So back to Dr. Joe. Terrific. Terrific, terrific. Daniel, delicious as always. So um, can everybody see the screen of the lovely green basil plant? We're good, good, fantastic. So um, this is basil and we're working towards our second recipe with, that, with uh, Chef Daniel. So ba holy basil, um, optimum tenny, uh, teniflorum. So this is uh, really quite a fascinating uh, food. It's also obviously an herb. It's an herb that I um, resonate with because we use basil in integrated medicine. Um, basil is originally uh, native to Central Africa and Asia, and it's a member of the mint family along with oregano, which is another herb we're not going to talk about, but it's another spice that uh, I, I use clinically and we also use in the book. So uh, there are many, many oregano uh, recipes. Um, and it's been used uh, for centuries uh, in Ayurveda, because uh, it also has come in native to Southeast Asia, and uh, to balance the, the doshas, which are the, uh, the essentially Ayurveda, which is Indian medicine, is a, is a balance of three elements, the vada, pitta, and kapha, uh, that is air, heat, and kind of uh, solidity or coolness. And uh, you are a composition of all three, a little balance of this, that, and the other. And if they are out of balance, then um, you, uh, you are out of balance. That's kind of one of the uh, tenets of Ayurveda. And so basil is a beautiful dosha balancing herb. Um, what we love about the basil is the essential oil. Again, it's another one of these plants that has this oil. And the essential oil contains uh, very interesting uh, organic um, and aromatic compounds like linalol, which is actually used in the perfume industry for floral scents. 
um, estragol, which um, is the scent of tarragon, and cineol, which uh, we in, in integrated medicine know very well because it's one of the main uh, uh, oils uh, or constituents of eucalyptus oil, and eucalyptus has anti-inflammatory and anti-spasmodic properties. Um, essential oils, as I've said before, will have multiple effects. They will uh, kill multiple different bacteria, viruses, uh, uh, and uh, and fungi uh, in vitro. They also have uh, properties that will, in vitro, meaning in a test tube, will have anti-cancer effects in terms of skin cancer cells, lung cancer cells, liver cancer cells. That doesn't mean that uh, you should be drinking basil if you have cancer. You should be seeing an oncologist if you have cancer. But basil does have anti-cancer properties. The essential oil does. So. Um, one of the reasons why we love basil is because it's an adaptogen, which uh, goes along with the whole concept of Ayurveda, of balancing the doshas. So in, 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 in the integrative medicine world, we have herbs from around the world that are used to help your body cope better with stress. And that's very much connected to the endocannabinoid system. In fact, I'm sure a lot of the adaptogens, when you do research, you'll find are working partially on the endocannabinoid system because the homeostasis is getting back into balance and that's essentially what adaptogens are helping you do get you back into balance so no wonder holy basil a well-known adaptogen would work on the endocannabinoid system and um, holy basil uh, has antioxidants uh, things like flavonoids and anthocyanins but the most interesting thing about holy basil is it is also full of beta carophylline just like black pepper so recipes that contain holy basil will have the essential oil of holy basil, which will be rich in beta carophylline, which will work on the CB2 receptors of the body, just like black pepper, just like oregano. Um, and so uh, the, the next uh, food that we're going to talk about, a different way of stimulating the endocannabinoid system, because again, the whole premise for the book is not just Let's see what we can do to stimulate the endocannabinoid system. The concept is using Dr. McCullum, Professor McCullum's cascade co um, uh, uh, effect. You're trying to stimulate the system in as many different ways as possible at the same time. You're simultaneously sim stimulating CB1 and CB2. So when you read the book, you're going to see that those 11 foods, each food is a chapter. So they don't all work in the same way. It's not just 11 spices that all contain beta carophylline, as you'll see right now. They all stimulate the endocannabinoid system in different ways because you're trying to do this consult, this cascade of hitting from here and here and here and here and here. And the outcome is that you get a much greater stimulation of this incredibly important uh, homeostatic system. So omega-3s we've all heard of, this is the part of omega-3s perhaps we're not so familiar with. So omega-3s are found in plants and in, um, and in animals and fish, basically. The plant one is alpha-linoleic acid. The, um, uh, the, that, that is converted by the body, the human body, not that well, but is converted to EPA and DHE, which are found in uh, fish oils. So when we talk about plant and animal sources, we're talking about fatty cold water fish, that would be tuna. Salmon, which we'll talk about in a second. Herring, mackerel, sardines, anchovies. Those are all healthy fish that are high in omega-3s. Or plant would be hemp, obviously. Uh, hemp is related to cannabis sativa. Uh, walnut, chia seeds, soy, kidney beans, these are all immediately plant sources. Um, what we know, and this is all scientifically shown, that people who consume omega-3s, so I'm not talking about supplements. Supplements is obviously an area of my expertise, but I'm talking about food in this book. There's no supplements. You are using food to have an effect on the endocannabinoid system. So people who consume a lot of omega-3s in their diet will have less depression, anxiety, dementia, and ADD. The HA, which is one of the two fish oils, is important because it's a major component. It's a major component of the retina of your eye. And so we know that when you go see the ophthalmologist, they're always telling you about omega-3s and macular degeneration. We know that omega-3s actually reduce incidence of heart disease, again, by eating the food. I'm not talking about the supplement, my friends. I'm talking about eating the food. And it does that by reducing triglycerides and blood pressure and inflammation and increasing the good cholesterol. Um, omega-3 can also, big study just recently published, 
showed that people eating high amounts of omega-3s can have a reduced incidence of autoimmune diseases. And in population studies, people who have high omega-3, this is one of the foods we like, those cold water fatty fish, reduce incidence of colon <laughs> breast cancer. So there's just a myriad of the reasons why you should be eating an omega-3 diet. What is new, what perhaps you haven't heard of, again, omega-3 inflammation. This is all stuff that, frankly, you could Google and find in 20 seconds. What is new is what it does to the endocannabinoid system. So just to take you back a second and to remind you, we make our, our own natural cannabis in our brain. We don't need THC and CBD. You can use that if you want. But you can also, we have our own anandamide and 2-AG. So if we're making this ourselves, what is anandamide and 2-AG? Well, it turns out that they're fatty, uh, uh, they're fa fatty compounds and they're made from omega-6. So there's omega-3 that is more in anti-inflammatory and omega-6, which comes from vegetable oils, that's more inflammatory, more pro-inflammatory. It turns out that omega-6, which is important, it's an essential fatty acid. When you eat omega-6s, what that's doing is that actually is the substrate, that is the, 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 the ingredients from which you're going to make anandamide and 2-AG, your, uh, your natural cannab cannabinoids you make in your brain. However, if you eat a lot of omega-6s, the body will realize that it doesn't want to make too much 2-AG and anandamide. So it will do something very clever. It will cause, it will down-regulate. So it will reduce the number of receptors in the body and in the brain of the CB1 and the CB2 receptors, because it doesn't want to have too much stimulation of the endocannabinoid system. So a diet that is rich in omega-6 will cause reduction in the amount of receptors that you have in your body and your brain of the endocannabinoid system. Now, what people realize is that the opposite of omega-6 is omega-3. And so what happens is if you have a anti-inflammatory high omega-3 diet full of those rich fatty fish or those plant omega-3s, what's happening is there's less production, there's less down regulation of the CB1 and CB2 receptors. So they stay high and your endocannabinoid system stays purring along and uh, working well. So as I said before, the concept in this cookbook is to use different foods to stimulate the system in different ways. So this had nothing to do with beta carophylline. It had nothing to do with an essential oil. This was to do with actually the receptors themselves trying to keep high levels of the receptors. Um, so I think we're now going to have a cooking demonstration of the second recipe. Daniel, take it away. Hey, Joe, we have so actually have a... I have made for years salmon fish cakes, but I never put so much basil in them before. Um, I did it a little bit differently, but now I'm going to use the basil because that's the key and the star ingredients. So I've got some fresh basil, got it nicely chopped up. I've got some salmon. I do like the Atlantic salmon. Um, you can use the Alaskan. It depends what your preference is. I do like the um, Atlantic salmon. A little bit of garlic or ginger if you want. Some lemon zest. And then sriracha. The sriracha is going to give a real kick. It's also got the uh, garlic already in there. So you don't need to overpower them with garlic. Non-stick pan. I'm going to turn up that heat just a little bit. And have it on a medium heat as I just blend this together. I will tell you. The family loves it. The, the kids loves these salmon burgers. So if you don't want to add too much spice, that's okay. I'm going to put a little bit of that sriracha in there. I'm going to have it on my own when I finish this demonstration. So I made it pretty spicy. I'm going to put some zest of lemon and get that in there. It gives a nice freshness. And also it works so well with basil. So I've got a nice amount of that lemon zest in there. Then I'm going to squeeze it using my hand to catch any of the pips, which there's only the one. And that just helps bind it as well. And I'm just going to lift this up so you can see, because I'm not sure if my camera is in there. So that's just the chili sauce, the sriracha, a little bit of lemon. The basil goes in there. The salmon goes in there. 
I'm adding a little bit of ginger. I like the sweetness that ginger gives. I'm going to pop it on my little mini blender, which is fabulous. Nice for one or two portions. Use a big blender if you're using more. I'm just going to bake it into like a burger. And then I'm going to show you something remarkable because when you're cooking like this with salmon, rich in omega, there's a natural fat. You actually do not need any oil in the pan. And I'm going to do that one burger there and make a second one on the side. You can make them as tiny little ones as appetizers, or you can do a big one and I'll give you a couple of things you can do with that. We'll cook it for about two minutes each side. So I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. You can serve it on a sesame bun like this. And the other thing you can do is if you want to be kind of paleo and healthy with this, because there's really nothing in this but protein, you can wrap it in some big salad leaves. So you know how you get those chicken wraps you can actually do it with this it tastes delicious so you can have a guilt-free amazing version i'm going to grab my spatula again should know where this is because it's my kitchen and you know i said to you just a few moments ago how you didn't need any oil in the pan you really don't with salmon look at that it turns no oil whatsoever i'm going to Turn those probably two or three times as I cook them. There's no breadcrumbs. There's nothing in there that kind of binds it other than just pure salmon. So it's nothing but the best. They'll take a couple of minutes. Those burgers, you can be creative. Always use salmon. Always use basil. And then throw a few other ingredients in. Uh, throw in some lemon. Throw in some capers. Uh, throw in your favorite spices. And after reading the book, hopefully what will happen is you'll realize that Pepper's really good. I'm going to add some more pepper to that. Basil's great. Oregano's great. Turmeric's great. We've got 11 ingredients that really focus on the natural way for your cannabinoid system to endocannabinoid system to activate. So once you get to learn these, add as much as you can. So back to Dr. Joe. Dr. Joe, you know, to all that adding more of these, we've got some recipes where we've done like the double whammy and we put more in. Or you can never have too much. So always add the more you can when you start seeing these recipes. Absolutely. So some of them have three or four cannabinoids together working in different ways. You know, the, the um, we want to take questions, obviously. Um, there are two other ingredients I just want to briefly go with. Again, this is to illustrate the point. These work on the endocannabinoid system in a completely different way. Now, we're not going to actually use them to cook tonight, but they have entire chapters. But I just think they're so neat because they don't work the same way and they're still part of what's called the cascade effect. So this is obviously truffles. If you didn't know what a truffle looked like, that's what a truffle looks like. Uh, truffles are tuber melanosporum. It's a fruit like fungus. It grows under the ground. It's near the, oaks, uh, the roots of oak trees. It takes seven to 10 years to really colonize the oak trees and, and grow big. It's actually helping the oak trees absorb nutrients. There are black winter summer burgundy truffles. They all have distinct flavors. They're considered to be the diamond of the kitchen. They're certainly a food that Chef Daniel uses. He's an expert on truffles. Some of them can get pricey, but if you know what you're doing, you can get reasonably priced uh, truffle infused oil. Truffles have been used for thousands of years. 4,000 years ago, the Amorites uh, were known to use truffles. And the Greeks thought that truffles were made by lightning strikes in moist soil. Truffles have some very interesting uh, characteristics from a nutritional point of view, one of which is that they are a complete protein. Humans have to have certain amino acids. They're called essential amino acids, and you have to eat them because you can't make them. Um, so animal protein generally has all the essential amino acids, and that's called a complete protein. There are many less complete proteins in the plant world, but truffles would you believe is a complete protein has all the amino acids that you would need and obviously truffles have an oil so that will have fat um it's also got calcium magnesium manganese and iron um truffle oil anti-microbial like many essential oils antioxidants anti-compound anti-cancer 
the point of the story for Truffles and the reason why it has such a great uh, uh, chapter with beautiful pictures in the book is how the truffle stimulates the endocannabinoid system. And it's just such a neat idea, which goes like this. Truffle pigs. We know that truffle pigs since ancient times, since Roman times, have been used to sniff out the truffles. Why, pray tell, are the truffle pigs looking for truffles? What's in the truffles? It turns out truffles are pure anandamide. And the truffles are being sought by the pigs because the pigs are going to get high from the truffles. So, big picturing this, why would the truffle be full of anandamide? A truffle is a fungus, it doesn't have an endocannabinoid system. What is in it for the truffle to be full of anandamide? And how does that benefit the truffle? So this is the cool part. The truffle is to attract the pig. The pig is going to eat the truffle. And then the truffle, the spores of the truffle go through the digestive system of the pig and come out in the feces of the pig that's then marching around southern Europe and now the spores are spread all over southern Europe. And so what you can see is that the way the truffle uses the pig in order to, in order to propagate its spores, which is why there are truffles all over um, uh, southern, uh, southern France. So it is a pure anandamide food and it's working on the CB1 receptors of the brain and that is essentially why you would want to have a truffle rich diet because it's going to help literally chill you out the final food my favorite bar none is dark chocolate which is cacao theobroma cacao um, this has been used in the Mayan civilization it was literally considered in the Mayan uh, civilization to be the food of the good just like ambrosia food of the gods just like ambrosia was in the greek uh, uh, um, uh, literature, and uh, it was supposed to think of supernatural forces. I think chocolate's great, and the traditional usage, which is always interesting, was that it helped lower fever and reduce inflammation, and that's not wrong. It works on the endocannabinoid system, so yes, it would help with inflammation. A couple of fascinating things. The, uh, the cacao tree, it takes five years to make the fruit, 40 beans make one pound of dark chocolate. The chocolate industry is 3 million tons of cacao per year. So you are making 240 billion beans are needed just to give us all our chocolate addiction. Chocolate has masses of effects. It's high in fiber. I'm talking about dark chocolate. I'm not talking about milk chocolate. Dark chocolate is medical food. Milk chocolate, that is a candy. Nothing to do with, it, with what we're talking about here. 85% dark, it's higher in fiber, actually more fiber than sugar. It's got magnesium, iron, copper, manganese, potassium, zinc, selenium, antioxidants. It actually helps increase blood supply to the body through nitric oxide, has a positive effect on the cholesterol. Even though it contains a saturated fat called stearic acid, it actually increases good cholesterol and doesn't increase bad cholesterol. How does it work? on the endocannabinoid system. Why do we have a chocolate chapter? The reason is because the body breaks down our natural and our cannabinoids, anandamide, 2-AG, but specifically anandamide, and it does that with an enzyme called FAAH. That is an enzyme the body makes in order to break down the anandamide. So we can not be chilled out all the time because we have to work. It turns out that there are two substances in dark chocolate, n linenal ethanolamide and n oleoethanolamide, and they inhibit this enzyme. And as a result, the enzyme therefore does not break down the anandamide, and so your anandamide levels stay high and your endocannabinoid system stays buzzing along. And so dark chocolate is another great food, lots of good recipes in the book, all there, together with other things, lots of different substances, different compounds that you're using together to stimulate your endocannabinoid system in as many different ways at the same time through food. So that's the end of the presentation. I am happy to take any uh, questions and I'm sure da Chef Daniel is. So I'm just gonna get rid of my PowerPoint and see where we are. Do we have any questions, my friends? Uh, yes, we have one question from Krishna. 
She says, I do not eat fish. Can you tell me what other foods are rich in omega-3? Yes, there are lots of plant-based omega-3s. Uh, uh, flax has omega-3. Um, chia seeds have omega-3. Um, uh, so does uh, um, uh, walnuts. And, uh, you know, so what I would do is try and eat some of those and have an omega-3 rich diet through plant as best you can. I want to be clear. Um, the advantage of having fish omega-3 is that the body has to convert the omega-3, the, the plant-based 18 carbon omega-3 into the 20 and 22 carbon EPA and DHA. So, um, and the body doesn't do a great job of conversion. Um, and if you aren't healthy, it really doesn't do a good job of conversion. So it's better to have both of them. But if you can't, then, uh, as I said, things like chia, which is a great food for a number of reasons, and the walnuts um, uh, and, uh, um, and flax, those are foods you should be looking at. Well, thank you. Here's my finished dish. Dr. Joe, thank you for everything. Thank you for explaining it in such great detail. It's fascinating. I love the fact I was able to learn so much about all of this and um, glad we have a book with lovely recipes. We do indeed. Any final questions or thoughts from our audience? Uh, no more questions. Okay. Well, good night, everyone, and thank you for being all with right. us. It has been a great pleasure. Really a pleasure. I hope you guys enjoy the book. Take care.